So my name is Steve Simpson. Um, I've given this talk a couple of times before, but only two, only at Postgres QL conferences. So this is the first time I've given anything like this outside a Postgres conference. So the usual response is, yes, that's great. We love Postgres. That's fine. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes down at a more, with a more broad audience. Um, with that in mind, a quick warning, this talk does contain a lot of SQL. So if that offends you, you this might not be the right talk for you to watch. Um, so I don't actually have any affiliation with Postgres QL. Um, so I'm not going to try and convince you to use it um, in this talk. That's your decision to make. Um, so quick overview. Um, talk split into about seven sections. Uh, we'll do a bit of background, a bit of uh, background on the use case, and then we'll go into uh, technical details. Um, there's also a small section at the end, which after running through this talk a couple of times, realized there really wasn't enough time to do it, but it needs to be mentioned, so that's why it's in small letters. So my background, so I'm primarily a software developer, and I've done a lot of this in the past. Um, I used to work on embedded hardware, so this is an Ethernet switch, um, 10 gigabit Ethernet switch, with a chip inside that can transfer uh, a terabit of data per second, which was quite fun to work on. Um, for the last five years or so, I've been working on databases. Um, a software company called Just One, they're a little startup in the UK, and they based their product off PostgreSQL. Hence my kind of interest in Postgres. So as I mentioned, I'm from a little known city, perhaps, from the UK called Bristol. One well, that doesn't really get a lot of attention in the news. Um, but it is, according to the BBC, the best place to live in Britain. So if you ever go there and you want to move there, move to Bristol, because it's great. Anyway, enough of that. So I work for a company called Stack HPC. So we do consultancy uh, on HPC for OpenStack. And that probably doesn't mean anything. It doesn't really matter for the purpose of this talk. And we work on systems that look a bit like this. So they're um, kind of, they fill rooms rather than uh, filling under your desk. Um, and something interesting about these systems is the amount of work they do is kind of staggering. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, it used to be that this was sort of, um, they were quite unique in this regard, but in the sort of the advent of cloud, you know, big data centers that look like this aren't really that unique anymore. But um, the problems they, child, they uh, face are quite interesting. So we work in partnership with the University of Cambridge um, on one of these. Not this entire system, maybe one rack of that system. Um, I'm building a HPC cluster, which is currently used for medical research, uh, processing brain images. Um, so that leads us on to kind of the use case for this talk, and that's monitoring. So I won't spend too long on this, um, but I think a bit of background is kind of useful. Um, so when we're monitoring, what we're interested in taking a load of information from those racks and racks of servers we've got, from the software, the hardware, um, and presenting it in some way so people can see when things go wrong and draw pretty graphs. Um, and this is kind of important for a number of reasons. Um, so fault finding and alerting, so we want to know when thing goes, things go wrong and when we need to fix things. Um, fault post-mortem and preemption. So in the keynote this morning, we were told that um, when we have a failure, the most important thing we can do with a failure is learn as much as we possibly can. And the way we can learn as much as we possibly can is by having as much historical information as possible before whatever went wrong went wrong. Um, utilization analysis, efficiency analysis. So how well are we using the hardware that we've spent you know, tens of millions of dollars buying? Um, performance monitoring, profiling, you know, auditing. Um, so making sure that people are using the system that are allowed to use the system. Um, and decision making, so future planning. My current system is this big. How big does it need to be in a year's time? So the common components of these kind of systems, you often get these sort of systems that do checking and alerting. They'll ping things. 
um, check that there's no disk errors, that kind of thing. Um, so log collection is a big one these days. Um, certainly gets a lot of press. So all of the logs from all of your 100 or 1,000 servers put in one place so you can uh, index them or search them. And then metric collection, so historical CPU usage or disk usage, for example. So why was my disk full? Answering that kind of question. Um, so the kind of incumbents in this space, uh, iChinga or Nagios, some of you might have used this kind of thing, um, does things like ping services, check that HTTP endpoints are available, gives you a little dashboard and it'll nag you at two in the morning telling you something's gone down and you need to reach for the coffee. Um, Kibana, this is quite popular these days, kind of gives you a search engine for all of your logs. Um, Ganglia, probably less well known. Um, it's very big in the HPC space. Um, and it's been around for quite a long time as well in this space. I don't think it used to look this pretty, but um, this is actually Wikipedia's uh, monitoring system. So if you go to, I think, Wiki Wikimedia, ganglia.wikimedia.org, you can go and look at what all their CPUs are up to. It's fascinating. You can waste hours in a hotel room doing this very late at night. Um, so a lot of you have probably seen this, Grafana quite a popular tool, similar kind of thing. Um, plots graphs for you, very pretty. Um, always wins points with kind of executive level people. Um, but the Grafana doesn't actually store any data for you, it doesn't actually collect any data, it's just a front end. Um, so what you need is you need a database to store all of the data that you want to graph. Um, so you've got a few choices in this regard. Um, so this list I wrote beginning of this year, I'm sure there's more, and I'm sure there's more kind of obscure open source projects as well um, that I haven't listed here, and there's definitely a big list of proprietary ones that I haven't listed here. Um, but these aren't small projects. They've actually got backing from some quite big companies. Um, people like SoundCloud and Rackspace and Netflix and Spotify. And they've all decided to write their own time series metrics database for this particular problem. So as I said before, Ganglia kind of came into existence around 2000, um, particularly in the HPC space, but some as well. Um, Graphite was kind of just a database, and that kind of emerged in about 2010. And then about 2013, just get this huge kind of spate of development of all of these new time series databases. And some of those you've probably heard of, in, uh, Prometheus perhaps, uh, InfluxDB, OpenTSDB. Um, so, a bit more background. So this system might kind of look familiar to you. It's something that we're working on. Um, or it's something that we've sort of taken on from some other people. Um, so we've got some stuff that's producing some metrics for us and some log files. Uh, we've kind of got this middleware in the middle that gives us this HTTP API and does some alerting for us. It's kind of a, it's trying to build a sort of an all-encompassing monitoring system. So we've got the checking, the logging, and the metrics all in one system. So we can do some information sort of analysis with that. So this middleware has a MySQL database. Um, so if you use iChinga or Nagios, you might have a, a database collecting history for you. Um, the metrics at the moment, we're taking, putting them in InfluxDB. Um, could replace that with any one of the other open source products we saw a minute ago. Um, that's got Grafana on top, so you can graph things. Grafana has a database which stores dashboards and state and um, now I think it can store alarm state as well, as of the most recent version. So that's got SQLite in it. Um, the logs go through a thing called Logstat, which you've probably heard of, and go into Elastic. Uh, that's got Kibana as the front end. Some people then wanted to put a message queue in the middle. So we've got Kafka there, just for fun. Um, so all the logs and go through. And you know, all this is done for good reason. I'm not knocking any of it. 
You know, people need to be able to handle huge rates of logs and bursty kind of data. So you know, it's a good, and it's a, you know, Kafka is a great bit of technology. Um, for all of, so for a couple of these things, we need a zookeeper database as well. We don't actually store much data in there, but it's needed for coordinating the others. Um, and then in this particular system we're working, we've also got Apache Storm, which is like a stream processing framework. And that takes data from Kafka and creates alerts and creates events in MySQL for you. So this isn't anything to do with what our systems are actually doing. This is just the monitoring for the systems. <laughs> right? I mean, some of you should be thinking, hold on. Don't we need a monitoring system for this monitoring system? Well, you probably do. Um, and the thing that worries me the most about these kind of systems is that there's six places in it which store data, six persistent storage areas. MySQL, Influx, Kafka, Elastic, Zookeeper, and SQLite. Um, and if you lose any of that data, the whole system kind of gets in a bit of a mess. Um, so, as I said, this is a commendable kind of right job, right tool for the job attitude. I'm not knocking it at all. Um, works very well. Lots of people use it. But could we at least unify the persistence of the system? Um, you know, fewer failure modes. Let's have fewer backup strategies we need to worry about. You know, if you're monitoring a business critical system and your monitoring goes down, how do you know your business critical system isn't down? You know, your monitoring system is as critical as any other system you run. So it needs backup. Fewer replication protocols. If anyone's ever dealt with SQL databases or any databases and try to replicate them, you know, things go wrong. And they're all different. So one set of consistent data semantics. You know. So a lot of these new SQL, no SQL databases, some of them have ACID, some of them are eventually consistent. You've got to go and learn in each one of those what it does. And the most important one for me is you can reuse existing operational knowledge. You know, you've probably already got somebody in your business that knows about MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server. Yeah. Why don't you just use that knowledge for something else? Um, so this was our idea. You know, could we at least sort of unify the persistence? Um, because all this problem is, is just data storage and analysis problem. Yeah. And we happen to know a bit about Postgres, so we thought, let's use that. We like Postgres. People use Postgres. Um, and, you know, we don't have to do it like this. You know, it can be microservices. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one big instance, you know, because that's, that's bad. We don't do that anymore. We don't have one big database. We have lots of little ones. And that's fine. You know, maybe we have one for metrics, one for logs, one for alerting. Yeah. So. We still have that separation, but what we're using is a common technology for all of this storage. So Postgres can do a lot of good things. Um, it can act like a lot of databases. A lot of these kind of NoSQL databases it can add. You can have JSON in it. You can do text searching in it. You can do searching within JSON. Um, you can, of course, have your normal kind of CRUD-style data in there. Um, but can it do time series? I mean, we've just seen a list of 20 databases that were kind of produced for this purpose. Um, so, time series. Bit of a uh, background about time series, bit of information. So, periodic time series. We've got some collector. Maybe it's collecting CPU usage. Maybe it's collecting temperature. Maybe it's collecting rainfall. You know. Maybe it's the next IoT gadget collecting something. Um, this data is going to have a time and it's going to have a value. In CPU usage, maybe we've got some percentages yeah, like that. And it comes in quite regularly. So every minute, every second, every 100 milliseconds, some fixed resolution. Quite sure what happened there. Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so what you might have 
Um, and in fact, what you more commonly have is multiple collectors collecting different metrics. Um, so every second or every minute, you'll get three metrics, three values. So to distinguish from these, we have some metadata. So we say, well, actually, these two are a CPU usage, and these two are a temperature. Um, and this is, I wouldn't say it's kind of the standard, but it's definitely a popular way that a lot of these databases store this data. Um, and we have this kind of dimensions or tags, you sometimes see it called, and you can tag it with one or more bits of extra information. So you could say, well, actually, this is a separate metric because it's on a different host, or it's in a different data center, something like that. And then every time period, you get one of these readings. And the time, the period might not be the same, but you kind of get the idea. You then have this kind of sporadic version of the time series where data sort of comes in whenever it feels like. Yeah. And in this case, you might actually want to store some extra metadata. So maybe you've got some, maybe you want to send some event every time you get a big chunk of logs and you want to record the message alongside it. Um, or maybe you've got some alarms going off and you want to store the reason that the alarm went off. Um, we're not going to focus too much on this today because I kind of think, even though a lot of people are thinking that this is a good application for a time series database, I don't think it's the uh, most interesting one. Um, so, what sort of data gets into this system? So at least in the system we're working on, JSON is the, is the king at the moment. Luckily, we've kind of kicked the XML habit, which I'm absolutely thrilled about. Um, but JSON's king, so everything's JSON. Um, got timestamp, doesn't really matter what format. You know, we happen to send them around in Unix time, but it could be anything else. Um, the value, so 42 is a good number, as we learned earlier. Um, and then we've got the information that identifies the metric. So we've got the name and the dimension, or tags, as they're called. Um, so we've got CPU percentage for host dev1. And there's that extra metadata field, which is kind of optional. And we're not going to worry too much about that. But it's there. It's kind of payload. So what sort of queries do we want to do on this data? Well, we want to take some of this data. Maybe we want to take one of the series. Maybe we want the temperature for this rack. We want to draw a graph. Maybe we want to take CPU usage for those two hosts, draw them on a graph. Um, so I think which is important about these queries we're doing is that we don't always want our entire data set. So we could be storing weeks, months of this data. We only want a few minutes of it, maybe the last five minutes. Um, so we want to, all the queries are bound by some time range. So this query is kind of important. Um, so we want to think about how we're going to, how it's going to perform as we scale various things in the system. So we want to grow the volume in the system. Maybe today we want to store days of, a day of data. Maybe tomorrow we want two days or a week or a month. Um, the number of metrics might change. New hosts might come online. New data centers might come online. We want to monitor them. Um, and the query complexity is quite an important thing to consider. In particular, the time range you're actually querying. Um, so if you want to query, a, you know, the complexity of a query to query a second of data is a lot different than querying a day of data. Um, so how does this map into the relational world? Quite easily, just map it like that. Um, just put it in the table in each row as a measurement. This might not be a good idea. Some of you might be crying right now, but it's a start. So in Postgres, just use time stamps TZ for time points. If you want to represent a point in time, just use time timestamp TZ. It's UTC, and when Daylight savings happens, it won't hurt you. Um, the value, um, floating point, is quite popular for this. If you're doing anything 
um, in this regard with anything that needs really strict accuracy, um, use numeric for that in Postgres. Um, it's a decimal type, so if you're doing things with money, like adding 0.1 and 0.1 will give you 0.2. So, you know, important things like that. Um, but in this case, it's just temperatures and CPUs, it doesn't matter too much. Um, for strings, just use varchar, fixed length, data types don't really matter in Postgres. Um, and even, I don't think, in any database anymore. Um, the way Postgres handles updates means that you don't really get any benefit from having a fixed size uh, field. Um, so J Postgres has this JSON B type, which is pretty cool. Um, so it can store arbitrary JSON, but it can also let you query inside it and search for things inside that JSON really efficiently. So it's a binary encoding, so it's a bit more compact. Um, but it also has just a JSON encoding as well. And really all this is just text field. Um, which is validated. And this is fine if you don't want to actually do any processing on it. It's just payload. And that applies to our value meta. So the other sort of query we want to do um, is we want to get a listing of the series, potentially. I'm not going to dwell on this too much because it's really not very interesting. You select the distinct things. Um, and in the table we just showed, it's going to be horrifically slow. Um, but we'll fix that a bit later. And we can optionally filter it so we can say, well, actually, give me all the metrics for this um, name. So give me all the series I can look at for the CPU. Or you could say, give me all the metrics I can look at for this host. So kind of interesting things to know. So this is the interesting one. The actual query that we're going to kind of focus on for the rest of the talk. So we're going to find some measurements from our table, and we want to specify a time range. And we want to say what series name we're looking at, and we want to say what tags we want. So we want the CPU percentage for that particular host. All very good. Now we're going to aggregate the data points to some period, because we're going to, you know, let's assume we're visualizing this data. We want to point every 10 seconds or every 60 seconds. So we're going to take the average over that particular time period. And we've just got a little help function called time round, which does that for us. Um, this isn't actually native in Postgres, but um, you can Google it. It's not very interesting. Um, and then we group by that interval and take the average value. This is kind of like the most basic time series query you ever want to do. Um, so. What we're concerned about with this query, well, we're concerned about how long it takes. And in particular, we're concerned about how long it takes when our data grows. So as our data volume increases, how long does the query take? And how long does it take as we expand the time range? So we want to query one day of data. Well, we also want a view of the last month of data. And we want those to be just as quick as each other. And really, our target for this is 100 milliseconds. Now, I'm not much of a UI developer, but 100 milliseconds is kind of the magic number that you can trick humans into thinking something is instantaneous. So if you can get something to happen, when they click a button, if it happens in 100 milliseconds, we kind of think, oh, that happened straight away. Fantastic. And it's a nice round number as well. So that's what we're aiming for. So this kind of red area on all the graphs, this is the danger zone that we don't want to get, get into. So for our relational model, um, we don't actually start off very good. Um, so, we've got, so what we're looking at here is as we expand the time range that we're querying, so these are in seconds, so we're querying 1,000 seconds, then 2,000, 3,000, for example. Um, and I've got three different series here um, for different volumes of the database. And what we can actually see is the query doesn't matter what range we're querying from the data, it still takes the same time. But if we increase the amount of data in the database, that's when it starts to slow down. So if we turn this on its head, uh, and instead graph this, so data volume now, um, you can see that it goes up. The query gets a lot slower as we put more data in. 
What's interesting is we'd actually be okay if we were sort of under a million rows. Um, so we could probably scan over 100 million rows, sorry, a million rows, not 100 million, um, in less than 100 milliseconds. So I guess a good thing about this is the query time's fixed, regardless of the time range. But um, And we're kind of on target for less than a million rows. But the time scales linearly with the volume of data. And this isn't very good. You know, We want to store increasing amounts of data in our database. And this is because every query that we do needs to read the entire table. Yeah. So anyone with any kind of knowledge of databases know where this is going. So we need to do some indexing. A couple of points. So timestamps are essentially integers. So there's nothing fancy about timestamps. Unix time since 1980. I think Postgres stores it a little bit differently. But Postgres has many different types of index. Um, B-tree, hash, brin, gin, gist. There's also one called rum, I think, which is going to be available soon. Um, I think gin and rum were made by a certain group of Russian uh, Postgres developers. Um, which I've met a couple of them at the conferences, and they're very interesting people, and very clever people as well. Um, so, B tree is excellent for equality in between operations. So that's worth bearing in mind. So a bit of B tree revision. Who's familiar with B trees? A couple of people. Okay. Well, you can all check your email while I do this. I'll just give a quick overview of what a B tree is for everyone else. Um, so you got some table. There's some data in the table. It's all jumbled up. It's all a bit of a mess. Postgres splits, splits data into pages. Don't have to be too concerned with that, but it does. Um, the index is a separate structure. And at the root of the structure, there's a page of data. So in Postgres, this, the number of things in this page vary. Um, but in this example, I've just shown it's two. Um, and that contains kind of the midpoints of the data. Um, and then just a classic tree structure. So all the values less than three go to a separate page, which is pointed to. All those between three and six are in their page, and all those between over six on a different page. And all of those point to the actual data. So when we query it, we can say seven. We're looking for number seven. Is seven greater than three? Yes, it is. Is it greater than six? Yes, it is. Da da, go down that road. Oh, look, we found seven. There's our data. The more interesting thing it can do is if you're looking for all the values between six and eight, so think timestamps, you can say, well, six is greater than three. OK, we found six. Great. We'll go and get the data for six. But it doesn't have to go back and do another lookup because the B tree is ordered. So if it needs, if it's looking for all the values before 8, it just walks the B tree and just finds 7 and goes on and finds 8. Really efficient. So that one B tree lookup, you know, and imagine this is two or three pages, so two or three disk IOs. After that, to get the entire time range, you're just walking through this index. Really, really efficient. So. With that in mind, let's look at our query. And we've got a between predicate. That's good. And this eliminates huge amounts of the table. So if we've got six months of data, we want five minutes. This is a really selective predicate. So it's an excellent candidate for an index. So we can do this. Create index on table using B-tree. In Postgres, B-tree is the default. So you don't have to say that. I'm kind of using it here explicitly. And you say we want an index on timestamp. So this is a lot better. So I've graphed here the result we had before without an index. And the graph here in yellow is with the index. It's staggeringly better, as you might imagine. Um, so we zoom in a little bit on that. Um, we can see we're well into our goal. Um, and it's kind of, so this is volume. So as the volume increases, there is still a bit of an increase as we increase the time range, but not very much. So if we put time range back at the bottom, we can see it's creeping up. So that's something to be aware of. 
but we're definitely a lot better off. Um, so now I'm going to introduce, we've had one metric up until now. Now let's say we've got 10 different metrics in the system. Um, so every 10th row, um, kind of a different metric. Unfortunately, if we go up to 100 metrics, this problem kind of exacerbates itself even more. And we definitely want more than 100 metrics. Maybe we want 1,000, maybe 10,000. So uh, we're kind of back in the danger zones. That's not good. So we're fine up, fine up to 10 million, and we're fine up to uh, 9,000 seconds with 10 metrics. And the query time's stable as the data volume increases. So this is a big win over where we were. Um, this, might, you know, this might seem straightforward, but it's worth understanding. Yeah, especially if you want to build more complicated systems. Um, so the time range kind of falls over with 100 metrics. Um, and it's now apparent that the query duration actually increases the time range grows. So it's no longer increasing as the data volume grows. It's increasing as the time range grows. Um, yeah. So the, and the reason why these metrics are causing such problems is because there's now more data to filter out before we can find the interesting stuff. So what could we do? Well, we could do more indexing. So there's two other clauses in here. And if you kind of read uh, you know, optimizing databases 101, it will say, go and look at your where clause and add indexes for the things in your where clause. So we can do that. And we can create a couple more indexes on the measurements table. So on name, we're just doing equality, so we can use B tree. For the JSON field, we can actually use this gin index. I'm not going to go into any detail about this, but this is a really cool index, and this is the thing that lets you find any key value in your JSON using an index in your JSON column. It's really cool. Um, could do a whole talk on that, so we're not going to go into that. Um, the problem is, now we've added these indexes, we've actually made it worse. So that yellow line there is with the extra indexes. Um, but you can see the line. And it actually just dips under. So we're going in the right direction here. And if we kind of extrapolated this, that red line would go up linearly, and that yellow line would sort of start to flatten out a bit. So as the volume, as the time range grows in the query, we're actually having a positive effect. Um, but too much indexing can be kind of harmful. So next step in databases 101, normalization. Um, so those people that were crying earlier about my table design can now uh, hopefully take a little relief. Um, so we take our measurements and we split it into two tables. Um, one table just stores our values. So in that table, what we're going to do is we're going to take the timestamp, the value, and that metadata and put that in there. And for the metrics, we're going to take the information that identifies the metrics, um, name and dimensions, put them in there. And the way we reference the metric is with an ID, as you might expect. And that references a metric in that table. So these are only stored once. And what we've done is we've re removed a huge amount of data from that values table. So that table is a lot smaller. And because we've only got that one thing identifying metrics, uh, we can um, eliminate a lot of data in that table. And this makes it a lot more efficient to read. So the metric table defines the identifiers, and you can use a serial in Postgres to do that, as I'm sure you can in most databases. Um, we then have this unique uh, constraint, because we only want to have one ID for each set of name and dimensions. And this handily creates the correct index for us. So when we're, no de when we're normalizing our data, the right index is in place for us. Um, so we can make this data make these two tables, mimic the measurements table we had at the start with a view. And views are defined by just a query. So we can say, when you query this, actually do this and give that data back instead. And what this does is it just joins the two tables together on our ID. And our query doesn't have to worry about any of that splitting out we just did. And in fact, if you look at the query plans, if you manually write the join, and if you write the query against the view, you'll see they're exactly the same. So you lose nothing by querying the view and having this layer in front, other than that your queries are simpler to read. So 
It's really good. So we can do a bit more trickery as well, just to make our life a bit easier. So we can say, the problem with the view is we can't insert into it, because it's a view, it's sort of a read-only representation of this uh, query that we've specified. But what we can do um, is we can say, on this view, when somebody does an insert to it, do something else. And in this case, what we'll do is we'll insert into our values table. And the only difference here is we've got this little helper function which allocates us a metric ID. So this is essentially doing the normalization for us, but it's completely transparent to the user, as long as all he wants to do is insert, which is all we really care about. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but this is a lot of code and it's a bit small. Although this projector is fantastic, so it does actually, it's almost readable. I won't bore you with it though. So it's a store procedure, it takes in the dimensions and it returns the ID. Um, to get the ID, you do that, and you select it. If it's not found, then you insert it, allocate a new one. Got to do some indexing as well. So timestamp index, same as before, and that occurs on the values table. And the, what we're also going to do is we're going to sort of add the indexing on the metrics as well. But instead of on the individual fields, we can do it on the ID. So this sort of serves a similar purpose to what we were trying to achieve before. So now when we look at this graph again, so as we grow the time range of our query, um, the yellow line is obviously with the, the indexes we had before, and the red one is what we've just done. And unfortunately, we're just back to where we started. So we started on blue with just the time indexes. We added some extra indexes, and then we just got back to the start again. Um, so something's not quite right here. So we've eliminated that additional overhead, but it still doesn't actually have the right effect. So I'm going to explain this thing called a bitmap index scan, um, which is what Postgres calls it. So we have our two indexes, and we say to the time index, give me the values between two and three. And from the metric index, we ask, give me the values which are equal two. So the time index dutifully says, well, this one is fine. This one matches, this one matches, this one matches. Good so far. Metric index says, that's a two, that's a two, that's a two, and that's a two as well. And then it combines these together, and it says, the rows you're actually interested in, because we're anding these two, is D and F. And this works quite well some of the time, but it works really badly a lot of, the, a lot of other times, and in particular, our use case. What would be better is if we just had one index that was for time and metric, and we said to it, well, give me all of the rows that match our clauses, and it just tells you that those are the ones. So luckily, you can do this, coincidentally. So our index that we had before, we've got a timestamp and our metric ID, and what we can actually do is we could create an index on both of these columns. And you end up with one index structure that represents both of these columns at the same time. So if you happen to have a query that's querying both of these columns, this index is absolutely perfect for it. Um, we have a bit of a problem, though. Which order do we put them in? Well, we could either put timestamp and then metric, or we could put metric and then timestamp. And if you look in the documentation, which I'm sure everybody reads, then it will tell you that if you've got a range, range predicate, then you're better off putting it on the right. Um, so our equality is on a metric. So we put metric first and then timestamp. And this is so we can take advantage of that brilliant behavior of that B tree again. So once we're doing our range, we navigate this B tree once to find the metric and then to find the start of our timestamp. But then once we found the start, we just iterate down the index. It's really efficient. This is, when I sort of discovered this, I was quite happy because I was thinking this is it's one of those cases where such a generic structure happens to be the perfect thing for what you're trying to represent. Um, so the line in green is good, and that's what we've just done. And this is staggering. Look how much better it is. So we've taken those two separate indexes, and we've turned them into one, it's really quite dramatic. 
And as you see, as the time range goes all the way up, we're still well in our uh, threshold. So let's make this a bit harder. Let's increase the volume a bit. So we were, um, we were looking at a database with 10 million rows in. So now let's up it to 100 million. So with 100 metrics, this is equivalent to about going from one day of data to 11 days of data um, at one measurement per second, one hertz. And let's increase the maximum time ranges as well. So before, we were topping out at a 2.5 hour range, and now we're going to be trying to get a uh, one day range. So again, we're just flat with data volume, which is good. But we are going up as the time range of our query goes up. And unfortunately, it goes up a little bit too high. So as we get to about 60,000 seconds or so, we're kind of creeping over that danger zone again. So this, we haven't got rid of this problem. As we query more data, it takes longer. Um, and as we increase the number of metrics, it goes really off the charts, literally off the charts. Um, but this is actually indicative of something very odd going on in the database. And this is that we're querying a lot of data. Um, and we're actually hitting some memory limits in the database. So with a bit of a config tweak, this does flatten off a bit, but it does raise an issue. Um, so we can go up to 100 million and up to some quite good time ranges for 10 metrics, but we do hit some limits. So we need a better strategy for handling this. So I call this summarizing. Uh, you can call it roll-ups or ag pre aggregation or a number of things. Um, materialization, all kind of mean the same thing. So, we've seen that for 100 metrics, we kind of miss our target. So for over eight, 11 days of data, um, this query might be returning up to 40,000 data points. So do we, is this actually necessary? If we're visualizing this data, if we're drawing a graph, why do we need 40,000 data points to draw this graph? All the graphing software is going to do is average them down. You know, and the average monitor's only got 2,000 pixels, so you can't see any of it. So it's a real waste. So let's just say that, say that 4,000 are enough, or even 400. You know, you're not going to use your whole screen for one graph. So what's the concept here? So the concept is we're bringing up a second table, and what we're going to do is as data comes into this table, we're going to store it in our summarized table until we get a time that kind of falls into the same bucket as a time we've already got. So we're rounding this time, so I call this values two. So every two minutes, we're going to have one summarized data point. So when we get this value in, what we're actually going to do is update an aggregated value in this table. So in this table, what we're actually doing is we're recording the sum of the two values that have gone in for the same time period. And then for this one, we go in there and update that. And now we're in a different time period, so we create a new one. And you see it goes on like this. We update this one and update this one. So we've ended up with a table that's actually a fraction of the size of our source data, um, which is going to be a lot cheaper to query. And you know, this is an example with two, but it could be any period that you like. So a bit of SQL to create this, create our table, we call it values 10. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll up every 10 uh, seconds into one second. Uh, and we have one entry per timestamp and per metric. And this is unique. So we have one. This comes in handy a bit later on. And then we actually record multiple different aggregates. So in that example I just gave, it was just sum. But actually what we want to do is we want to record a count and a min and a max and anything else that you might want to record. Um, so when you come to query this data, you can say, give me the sum. And for that entire period, it's just already there, computed for you. 
And we can even make this look a bit nicer. So we can do the join that we did before with our view. So we can create our summary. And because we're only storing the metric ID, we need to get the other data from the metrics table. And this just simplifies queries. And it does the join for us. So how are we going to implement this? Well, someone in the last talk says triggers are awful, so we're going to use triggers. Sorry about that. Um, there are other ways to do this, but triggers are the simplest way to describe this problem. And once you kind of understand the fundamentals, you can think of umpteen other ways to do it, with message queues in the middle and eventual consistency and database over here and over there. But triggers are a really easy way to do it. So this is all just boilerplate. Don't worry too much about this. This is just defining a trigger and then attaching the trigger. So when we insert a row there, it puts it over there. This is the interesting one. So this is what we run when we insert a row. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to insert into our summary table instead. And in this example, new is the row which is entering the database. So we round the time down. So we get the time period up to, say, 10 seconds. And then these are just the initial values for the aggregate. So for the sum, the initial value is just the value. For the count, the count is now 1, because it's the first row. And the min and max, the initial value is the value. If, however, there's already an entry for that timestamp and that metric, which we can say using on conflict, then we update the row that's already there. Um, and what we're essentially doing here is we're kind of aggregating a little bit. We're doing a bit of that aggregation which we've been doing at query time. So for the sum, we just add the sum to the sum that's already there. Uh, for the count, we just add the count that's already there. And well, we're just adding one because we defined one earlier on. The min and max are a little bit more interesting. So the value that's already in the table, we take the min of that with the new value that's coming in, and likewise for the max. So if we look at the query, it's actually mostly unchanged from before, except we're now querying this summary table instead, which, remember, is now a tenth of the size. So that's really good. And the only bit of fiddling we have to do is um, the, we've got a, we're now aggregating aggregates. So for sums, we have to sum, sum the sums. For counts, we have to sum the counts. And for average, we kind of have to do that ourselves. So a little bit fiddly, but not too complicated. You can also do standard deviation if you also record sum of value squared. So now, as we scale the time range of our query, we're right back down where we should be. And if we compare that to where we were before, we're doing a lot better. And this makes perfect sense, because we're only querying a table that's a tenth of the size. But we've lost nothing in as far as the user is concerned. So this, is, this really is the key to kind of what all of these time series databases are doing. They're doing this kind of pre-aggregation. You know, if you look under the hood, that's what's going on. Yeah. And you can have more periods as well. So have a 100 second roll-up period, for example. So you can query months or years of data really fast. Yeah. And this isn't kind of a new concept in in the database world either. So just for fun, let's increase the volume to a billion rows. Anyone run a database with a billion rows in a table? Yeah, bad idea, isn't it? Oh, interesting. We should talk after. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of this is a bit of a cheat, because we're not actually querying a billion rows. We're querying a tenth of a billion rows. But we can do it, and you get some quite interesting results. Um, so we've now, you know, we could store, this is now equivalent to 16 weeks of data, and we're querying up to 10 days. So as the data volume increases, so even all the way up to a billion, that index lookup isn't getting any more costly. You know, this is a really well-engineered well bit of code. Um, but of course, the, you know, the amount of time that it takes goes up. And if we look at the time range we're querying, so we're querying a billion rows, a billion rows, and we're querying up to uh, 900,000 seconds of data, which, what did I say was earlier? 11 days or something. 
and we get all the way up here before it actually gets to being too slow. So we're querying all this data, but the user just sees it coming back instantly. It doesn't really know what's going on underneath. This is fantastic. Um, and if you want to scale it further, maybe do 100 to 1. And this makes sense as well. If you want a summary over a year, you really don't want every one second data point in that. So I'm completely out of time, as I thought I would be. Um, and this is the section that was in small letters at the front of the talk. Um, but it is so important that it kind of has to be mentioned. So I'm going to be very quick about it. So partitioning. Splitting your table by time interval into lots of little tables. And what this does is this makes deleting old data really fast. You just drop tables. So you've got a six-month retention period. Any data older than six months you want to drop really fast. This is the way to do it. It also makes it much more efficient to maintain the tables you've already got. And you can do some really cool things like re-index and cluster index. And this can make your queries even more efficient. Cluster index especially is really good. Um, uh, older data can be put on slower disks. So maybe uh, half a second response time is OK for data that's a year old. Um, and you can avoid some performance issues, which you do get when you have very, very large B trees. You know, once you get to tens of billions of rows in one index, some things do start to happen, especially with regards to ingesting data. Um, you can also partition by metric, so putting different uh, chunks of metric into different tables. So we're splitting by metric. So that would be on the name or the dimension, the hash, for example. Um, and this will allow you to scale the number of metrics in your system almost forever, because you just have a different system for a different set of metrics. And if what you can do is, in the monitoring case, if you can put all the metrics from a group of hosts, say a data center or a rack, into different databases, then you can actually build a view on top of that and make it look like one really easily. Um, this needs a talk all of its own, though, unfortunately. So this is where we finish. A couple of minutes over. Um, so come and talk to me afterwards if you have any questions or if you think it's a horrible idea. Thank you very much. <laughs>